Welcome to the Aesthetic Doctor Podcast. We don't shy away and keep secrets here. We empower you with education, telling you the truth about all things aesthetic medicine while encouraging you to be the best version of yourself. It's time to look great and feel good doing it. This is your host, mom, speaker, and board certified physician, Dr. Judith Borger. Hello, friends. This is Dr. Borger, and welcome to episode 66 of the Aesthetic Doctor podcast. Today, I'm so honored to have Dr. Anafat Balogan here from SkinMD in Seattle, which is an office in Seattle that focuses on non-invasive balance, natural face and body rejuvenation, including and specifically in skin of color. Dr. Balagan, by training, is a craniofacial reconstructive surgeon, a head and neck surgeon who now practice non-invasive aesthetic and regenerative medicine at Skin MD in Seattle. She is a consultant and national trainer of both Botox, dermal fillers, and PO thread lift treatment techniques. And as a physician of color and with a special interest of treating skin of color, she is here to talk to me about post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation or PIH. What is post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation? Well, we're going to go really, really deeply into it with Dr. B. However, in brief, it is really sort of that uneven areas of darkness or redness or uneven pigment that you may get after uh, an area of inflammation somewhere. So if you, let's say, had a spot of acne or an ingrown hair or something like that, a little cut, and then resulting from the healing process, you're getting a little bit of different color. Affects lots and lots of people. Can't wait to talk all about it. And we have a true expert in post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation in Dr. B. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy our interview and welcome Dr. Bolligan. Well, friends, as I said in my introduction, I'm so excited to have the amazing Dr. Anifat Balogun with us today, all the way from Seattle. And we are going to talk about something she's a true expert in, which is post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Certainly a problem that affects many, especially those of darker Fitzpatrick type skin types. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, actually our episode two ago, I talked all about how we tend to classify skin types based on melanin production and how they respond to sunlight and radiation. So it would be a great one for you to check out if you have any questions about that. But in the meantime, going back on to post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation or PIH, as we most commonly call it. And welcome, Dr. B. How are you today? I am well. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. So PIH, I'm um, going right, right back to the beginning. So can you just tell our listener, like when we talk about PIH, what is it? What is it that we're actually talking about? PIH is essentially excess pigment production that occurs at a site where there was inflammation or irritation of the skin. So for example, you got a scratch, you had an acne lesion, which is a very, very common way that this occurs, or you had a, a cut somewhere as the skin heals, particularly for patients with skin of color, but in all skin types, there might be a tendency to have kind of a concentrated pigment deposit that happens at that site and it can be anywhere from kind of a deep, dull reddish color to a kind of blue brown or blue black color. I love that. Thank you for giving such a concise answer. So basically, when we talk about it, what you're saying is that we're getting sort of an overproduction of a colored pigment. Most of the time it's melanin, right? Or like sort of an irregular dispersion of pigment after. And that's the second part that's really important that I want to highlight for our listeners, after something that causes cutaneous inflammation. You brought up a lot of the most common causes and 
kind of seeing that you brought it up, let's kind of go into that. What are some of the things that cause people to develop PIH? You already said cut, acne is a huge, huge, huge thing that we see. What are some of the other things that cause people to have PIH? So it can be something as simple as a scrape on the skin mm -hmm. or a, a mild skin infection. Some people with autoimmune disorders, where, and again, the overarching background is inflammation of some sort. So there's all these categories of inflammation. And then as the skin heals, it tends to sort of dump more pigment disproportionately to that area as a form of protection, really. Obviously, we don't see it as that because right. it shows up as a difference in coloration from our baseline color where it tends to happen. Most distressing for patients is when it happens on the face, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, the body. yeah, so how common is it really? Unfortunately, it is very common. It is, I would say, and again, skewing more for skin of color because you can see that difference between the hyperpigmentation, essentially, and the baseline skin color, kind of more on skin of color because their melanin is sort of hyper-responsive. And so I would say it is the top concern for patients with skin of color in terms of balancing their um, skin tone, skin pigmentation. Yeah, and I just wanted to support what you said because I kind of pulled up some studies and some research on this in preparation for this argument of this episode. And I'm, I'm looking at this here. I think that there was 65.3% of African-Americans sort of said that they had experienced hyperpigmentation and also like, other types of skin of color. Of course, it was in over 50% of Hispanics and in close to 50% of Asians in one study. And then there was another study that kind of quoted numbers that were about 71% of the whole population that they surveyed that self-identified as skin of color that had experienced distressing post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, or like you said, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation that bothered them enough that they would see it in as issues, seek medical care for it. So of course, these are population-based studies and the numbers vary, but I just wanted to kind of pull up some of the research that I had pulled up that illustrate how great of a percentage, especially of our population with skin of color, it really affects. Yeah, it's definitely when it comes to, you know, it is non-pathologic, but it is very psychologically distressing to the person experiencing it, right? Because they're looking at this irregular color dispersion all over their skin and everybody sort of wants a more even skin tone and you do not want to be reminded of the acne of the past or some injury or inf infection you had in your skin. Yeah, absolutely. So we already talked about who's affected, but just to highlight, even though PIH can affect all skin types. When you talk about Caucasian skin, a lot of times we get some redness that tends to fade while the more color you have, meaning the more melanin you have in your skin, number one, your PIH tends to be more severe, correct? Yeah, yes. It tends to be, the general rule is the darker you are in terms of skin type, the richer your Fitzpatrick tone the darker the hyperpigmentation tends to be and the more challenging it is to reverse. And so prevention is obviously key and then not exacerbating it with skin types four through six, the richer Fitzpatrick types, there is still an uphill battle kind of convincing us that we need to wear sunscreen every day. And so especially if you have a tendency to hyperpigment, then you are doubly, quadruply, it is quadruply important for you to be wearing broad spectrum UV protection every day. 
Yeah. So what I also found really interesting is that even though they can kind of measure, obviously, sort of the increase in all of the inflammatory markers, and they can basically say there's an increase in prostaglandins, there's an increase in cytokines, there's an increase in oxygen-free species, it still is one of those things that they're like, well, the exact mechanism is sort of unknown. Other than there is the inflammation, which I'm sure both for patients and treating physicians, whenever they say the exact mechanism is unknown, it's a little bit frustrating. Yes. I mean, we kind of have a, a general understanding that part of the body's or the skin's response to injury mm -hmm. is the creation and deposition of melanin. That deposition, the showing up of melanin in your skin is an indication that your body is trying to protect itself from something, whether it's UV rays or it's healing from an infection or a scrape. It's sort of a global response that the skin does. It's like, okay, we have to just get everything there to tamp down whatever the offending factor is a byproduct is oh well it was nice of you to heal my skin but i could have done without the hyperpigmentation yeah. right now let's talk about treatment if you're okay with that so like you already brought up some really important things that of course the first thing we do and you treat a lot of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation is to really Think about the underlying issues. So let's say if you, you mentioned acne several times, if you have acne lesions that either just from the acne lesions, of course, we don't ever encourage picking or any of this stuff, you get hyperpigmentation. We obviously first want to treat the acne and reduce the acne. So we kind of go to the source or the same thing as we do. We find some patients that have some facial hair. And then again, just the idea of, plucking it or tweezing or waxing. So we kind of do things like, of course, skin type appropriate laser hair removal so that we can get rid of that source. So number one is obviously if we know there is an underlying inflammatory process that we can affect, such as acne, such as the shaving or the plucking or the waxing, we want to kind of take care of that. You also mentioned a step two photo protection or sunscreen, really, really important. But what are some of the medical therapies that um, we can use these days to treat post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation? Agree that targeting and calming down the inflammation is very important, right? So like you said, control of acne so that you're not trying to control the hyperpigmentation, but the source is still present, right? For patients in whom unwanted hair or hair in general. So for men who have pseudofolliculitis, like ingrown hairs that cause inflammation, and then they get hyperpigmentation on top of it, the gold standard treatment is laser hair reduction. Of course, thankfully, a lot of modalities these days will help control the inflammation as well, which is kind of a win-win photo protection, of course. And then for those in whom you are dealing with other inflammatory conditions, we want to manage them with medications, if oral or topical as indicated. So for some patients, if your hyperpigmentation is coming from say, atopic dermatitis, your systemic lupus, then you want to manage the lupus. And then you can focus on either topical or oral minimally invasive therapies to help with pigment reduction, right? And when it comes to pigment reduction, there is such a host of modalities or means that we can use to help reduce that pigment, right? There's a topical, everything from topical hydroquinone, varying percentages, whether by prescription or compounding pharmacies, again, depending on the skin type or how the patient has responded in the past, to oral medications nowadays, oral tranexamic acid is sort of in vogue as a way to manage hyperpigmentation. And then of course, there are laser therapies that can be used that specifically target hyperpigmentation. So anything from long pulsed ND YAG or microsecond ND YAG to picosecond lasers. Again, you need to go to someone who is well versed in managing pigmentation. If you're skin of color, there's an extra 
layer of sort of due diligence you need to apply to make sure that you do not inadvertently get worsening of your hyperpigmentation in the process of trying to reduce it. Yeah, I love that. Everything that you said. And of course, hydroquinone has really been the gold standard depigmenting agent for like ever and ever and ever, right? And um, of course, it sort of blocks the conversion of dopa to melanin by inhibiting tyrosinase, which is the enzyme that's responsible for that. And then there's, you said, there's a variety of topical other things, and most of them aim to inhibit that same enzyme, tyrosinase. And I'm sorry if I completely mispronouncing this enzyme, but things like retinoids, things like azelaic acid, things like kojic acid, niacinamide, it does the same thing, but does not inhibit the same enzyme. And then of course, ascorbic acid, vitamin C, licorice, like all sorts of things. So like you said, there's a host of yeah. things more <laughs> or less effective. Yes. And really it becomes a function of which one and in what combination, right? So even with hydroquinone, the classic combination was the hydroquinone at 4% with a um, potent, medium potency steroid and a kind of low-ish dose retinoid. And obviously there's a lot of eye raising about the use of hydroquinone these days, hence the rise of the other modalities. Azelaic acid is great because especially if your hyperpigmentation is coming from acne and you still have active acne postules, then you can sort of kill two birds with one stone. And it's safe in pregnancy. So that's the other thing. Yes, yes. And so, yeah, you know, yay for azelaic acid in that um, regard. And then the niacinamides and the kojics and the licorice extracts. Then you talk about combinations because they work well for some, but not for many. And so while they seem to be ubiquitous and everybody is throwing it into a lot of things, particularly over the counter, I have patients who come in and they're like, well, I've been on the niacinamide and whatnot, and it doesn't seem to be helping. And I'm like, yeah, because it's freely available, but the reason you're in my office is because there are potentially other means given that you have this particular skin type and this particular skin condition, and you're not probably not getting to kind of the core of the pigmentation cycle, right? Oftentimes. Well, okay. and the other thing we need to remind patients of a lot of times, the reason you can buy it at Target or Walmart is because there's a tiny little fraction that maybe can be found in it. Okay. It's not the same as somebody, you or I, or dermatologist prescribing a prescription sense just because, you know, your over the counter drugstore product says it has X in it. There's maybe a trace found in it. Otherwise, they couldn't just put it on the shelf at your local drugstore. <laughs> That, yes. Yeah. That is a good point to, to let people know for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing, obviously you're absolutely right. TXA is all the rage that also is an antifibrinolytic that decreases melanin formation, you know, used extensively for melasma now has a little bit of limited research for PIH. Would you speak a little bit about chemical peels as well for PIH, because that's another, I think, treatment class that we haven't really mentioned. Yes. So chemical peels are a great way. Typically, I start with topical therapy first. Have mm -hmm. the patient sort of get used to using that because it is really going to be part of your maintenance. Because unfortunately, once you have hyperpigmented, it's sort of like your skin holds onto that memory and tends to like producing more pigment in areas of inflammation. So Chemical peels are a nice way to essentially exfoliate and jettison the surface pigmentation or epidermal post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Definitely a slow and steady wins the race. And I take great pains to let my patients know there are mostly superficial chemical peels that have depigmenting agents in them, right? They're sort of more modern blended peels that have a little retinoid, some have tranexamic acid, some have the albutamine licorice extract that we've discussed. And the idea is you slowly and gently move the patient forward towards that more even complexion. And so for the patient who thinks, oh, I'm going to be done with this in three months, we have the conversation that this is not, I, I wish I could wave a magic wand and kind of just 
disappear your pigmentation, but unfortunately that's not how your body will respond, especially that it has already told us that in response to inflammation or irritation, it will dump more pigment. Yeah, so superficial peels are lovely. We use them very often in the clinic. As long as patients sort of understand that it's not going to be three peels and my skin will be back to like I never had the acne, then we kind of, it's an ongoing process. And when do we stop? When we see pretty even pigmentation and you're happy, right? But obviously realistically happy. You can't, <laughs> we sort of have to manage expectations, but also set a tone of reality into it all. I, I love that you brought that up because I say the same thing. I wish I had a magic wand or a magic eraser and I could just <laughs> do the thing that you do on Photoshop and I just erase yeah. it off. That's not oh, how it works. It's so fantastic. Like you kind of had talked about with peels and very specific limited, limited use of certain lasers. Like again, very limited use because again, lasers can really cause this. And the same thing with too aggressive of a peel. We don't want to cause inflammation, right? That's the whole idea because it's definitely if they're, especially in skin of color, if people do inappropriate peels, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation can happen when somebody does a peel on a patient of color who was really should not have had that peel or that it was too aggressive and too deep. So tell me about your practice. So you're in Seattle, you're a woman of color, you're a physician of color. So when we chatted briefly, you treat a lot of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, correct? I do. I want to uh, make a teeny point before we move to- Anything so you would like. And that is one, if you overdo a peel in a patient with skin of color, you also run into the potential for hypopigmentation, Hypo, which is yes. just as distressing. And yes, in my clinic here, I'm in Northeast Seattle. A lot of my patients are skin types four through six, kind of all across, you know, name an area in the world and that you can see your patient with skin of color. And I pretty much have a patient from there. And we are dealing with a lot of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation from unwanted hair, from kind of skin trauma, kind of childhood trauma. It's like, oh, I fell and I had this cut, it healed, but now I have this either line that kind of cuts across my face, acne, acne scarring, and the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation that develops from there. And then even like post-pregnancy stretch marks and then growth, you know, stretch marks, right? Around shoulders and knees and hips and things like that. So we are definitely well-versed in, okay, these are the things we can do for you as a patient with skin of color. These are the things that you need to be doing at home so that I can look like a rock star when everything gets all sorted. And we have a real conversation about how are we going to proceed? This is not going to be a one and done because if there really was a one and done treatment, I would be kind of phoning this in from my fifth house in Cape Verde, right? <laughs> Um, I want a fifth house in Cape Verde. That sounds great. <laughs> right. And one thing I tell my patients is I also, I'm a patient who is dealing with post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation from acne. And just for giggles, I have melasma on top of it. And so I am doing things on a daily basis to kind of keep pigment at bay with topicals that I use daily and sunscreen daily, every day. They're like, even if you're home, I'm like, Yes, even if you're home, you sit in front of the bay window, enjoying the good weather that we're having these days. You're in front of your computer. A lot of our patients kind of work from home and they have like a dual screen. So they really have like a parabola. They're it could be, they're being bathed in blue light for eight to 10 hours a day. They're on their iPods and whatnot, iPads and small screens. And so I'm like, all of that can make your hyperpigmentation worse. And so the things that you do on a daily basis are the things that are going to home run any treatments we do in the office. And then we are using peels. We do micro infuse deep pigmenting products like the tranexamic acid, particularly for patients with stretch marks who have discoloration on top of it. So we're getting kind of the skin retexturization, skin tightening, and then infusing Things like trying when you to say micro infuse, do you use micro needling? Do you use something like a textile to create channels? How do you do it? 
We have a micro infusion device. Oh. Like it's kind of, I'm trying to remember the name of it now. Oh, it's like the aqua gold. So you're dispensing. Oh yes, we have an aqua gold. It's like a little stamper almost like where you can also use like for patients that have no idea what you're talking about. Would you just <laughs> describe it? Because we're talking about it and some people might be listening being like, what yes. gender are you guys going off on? So it's a device that looks like it's a vial with a needle array on top of it. But those needles have etched in them a screw thread. So there's a depression in each micro needle, essentially, that allows the um, precise um, depositing of the solution. So I source the solution from Europe, and then we get the medical tranexamic acid solution. And oftentimes we're using those solutions in the micro channeling or micro infusion device so we can get the solution precisely into what I call the business end of skin, kind of the source of where the melanin is being produced so that we can kind of show right, it down. Because for patients, if you want to think about it, if we put it on top of the skin, which of course we do with the majority of things, we're basically relying on the skin to absorb and to absorb it to a certain depth. We also know that there's certain molecules depending on their size, depending on their acid-base status, lipid or not lipid status, have a harder time infusing only get infused or absorbed incompletely or don't get absorbed too deep. So by uh, what she's describing is that by creating little Michael channels, and we do have the aqua gold device as well. We don't use it as much for hyperpigmentation as we use it to do like more the regenerative things, the like microtox and the B vitamins and the like filler. But the whole idea is like she said, this device, it creates a micro channel at the same time as it creates a micro channel because there's a reservoir at top where the solution is, it deposits the solution of whatever you want. So what Dr. B is doing, which is actually amazing, is to use the depigmenting agents and to, instead of just putting them on top of the skin, also deposit it sort of in the epidermis where a lot of your melanocytes live, which are the things that make the melanin. Yes. So yeah, we kind of use a combination of modalities to get patients the global improvement, right? So we don't want to just deal with your pigmentation if you have acne scarring and active acne. So we also use a microsecond laser, so 1064, that is very helpful in treating hyperpigmentation. So for patients who have, say, unwanted hair and PIH from that, we'll use the laser to help First, get rid of the source of the inflammation, the hair, and in doing those, it does help with pigment lifting. And then when we have adequately reduced the unwanted hair, whatever residual pigmentation is left, we can either do spot treatment with the microsecond laser, or we can switch to a modality, say they have textural irregularity, then we can switch to a series of superficial peels, for instance. And so they're getting, when we're all done, they will get a global improvement. And of course, there is that subject of maintenance. We would like to believe that once we have gotten to a happy place with our pigment, that we're done. And so we get to kind of slide off our daily skincare routine, our daily sun protection. And we have to kind of keep that conversation going of, you still need to wear sunscreen every day because if you get overheated, that pigment that we work so hard to kind of get rid of will likely resurface, obviously in a different area, depending on where you get your UV protection or where you got any sort of inflammation. If you tend to suffer from acne, you still need to be on your acne control medications, whether it's topical, oral, or both, just to keep that up. So yeah, kind of ongoing discussions and working with the patient as a team, you do your part, I'll do my part, and then we'll both be happy kind of thing. Yeah. And I love that you brought that up because certain conditions that are more chronic and we know that inflammation is sort of a chronic process. You're right. There's going to be flares. There's likely going to be maintenance treatments needed, even though, like you said, we wish we had the magic eraser and everybody <laughs> could just ride off into the sunset, right? Yes. So here's a question that I ask all of my guests that are in the field of statics. Two questions, really. So first of all, your skin is beautiful. It's glowing. I hope you all see Dr. B on YouTube. <laughs> Thank now, you. Audio, even though I know most of you are listening, her skin is just 
beautiful and even and glowing. So you are doing a lot of things right. And I definitely see how patients are drawn to you because I want my skin to look like yours. Oh, thank you. Yes. Like I said, because I'm also managing pigment issues, acne issues. If you take a close look, there's like a crop of acne all down the left side of my face or the right side of my face. And it's one of those things like, this is me four days after a superficial peel. Thank you very much. And so, and sunscreen, like three different layers. And I, I use that phrase. I'm not just a doctor, I'm a patient as well. So I do really all those things that we've talked about to kind of keep pigment at bay and kind of reduce the hyperpigmentation that's already in my skin. It's a process. <laughs> Well, yeah, you're not just talking the talk, you're walking the walk along with, and you know, I have rosacea and it's sort of a little bit the same thing. I feel like I've become a rosacea center of excellence uh -huh. just because also being a sufferer, I have all the treatments and somehow I have like accumulated this huge rosacea population. But I think it always kind of helps that when we're alone affected, not only we want to emphasize with all people, but I think it there is this authentic voice about being like, yes, I have this and I'm dealing with this and sort of you have an interest more than just the medical interest in becoming an expert, because again, you are one of your patients, right? Yes. No, I joke and say the reason we have the microsecond lasers, because I knew it would work for my <laughs> skin issues. <laughs> yeah, but it's the same with my rosacea laser. It's the best there is because I needed to get this rosacea under control. Under control, yes, absolutely. <laughs> but anyway, the question I ask everybody, and I think it's a fun question, is like, what is your favorite treatment to perform? And what is your favorite treatment to receive in the aesthetic world? Oh, I have to pick just one? I know, right? <laughs> Let's see. I would say my favorite treatment to perform is actually, I guess it's a toss up, really. I enjoy, <laughs> okay, I enjoy Botox because it's so versatile. I use it for expression lines and I use it actually for some of our patients who are oily acneic. Like we do the micro infusion of the microtox or the Botox to help reduce pigmentation, which also helps with some skin refine. It kind of gives you kind of this soft focus glow. So both for expression lines, of course, it's, it's still one of the top procedures pretty much in any clinic these days, but that microtox is definitely a one of my favorites, both to deliver and to receive because I have oily acne skin. <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm like, well, if it's good enough for my patients, it's good enough for me. And we obviously make it as comfortable as possible. So patients have a great, great experience that I don't think what they're being tortured. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much. Like this was such an informative um, conversation. Thank you. Like you really taught us so much about PIH and I know like lots of our listeners and patients are going to um, feel very helped by this. So before we go, I would love for you to tell us where people can find you, especially in the intro and in your little intro. We said that you were in Seattle. So of course, there's Seattle patients. If you do anything online where they can connect to you on social media. So please, we link all of this in the show notes, but please let our listeners know where they can connect with you and where they can find you. Yeah, they can find me at uh, skinmdseattle.com, the website, and then on Instagram, we're Seattle Skin MD. I have a personal um, Instagram as well, but most patients reach us through our um, Seattle Skin MD and obviously calling or emailing us directly from our skinmdseattle.com contact us page. Well, again, thank you so much. Is there anything we missed before we go? No, I think, you know, I mean, obviously we could talk about this all day long. There's all these nuances and whatnot, but I think we covered kind of the the big points on the topic and yeah thank you for allowing me to share and have a conversation with you about this really important topic that is kind of concerning to everyone and allowing them to know that there are treatment options available to them and again thank you also for the work that you do in the world and for seeing so many patients and for helping so many patients because like we just in the beginning of this like a lot of the reason we do this and I always say this is that like aesthetics 
really like if somebody feels not confident about something, it's an incredibly deep and empowering field to be in. It sounds so cheesy to say it's beyond skin deep, but it really is because I feel like with the work that we do, we've really changed lives and we give people their confidence back to look in the mirror, to go out on that day, to love the way they look and feel and you show up differently in the world. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all the wor work you do to help your patients. Thank you for getting the word out and getting, making sure people hear and see that there are options available to them if they're having skin issues. Well, lovely listeners, this is Dr. Borger, and this is the end of our current episode. Thank you again for tuning in, and we hope you, to see you next time. Bye now. Thank you for listening to the Aesthetic Doctor Podcast with Dr. Judith Borger. We'd love to connect with you outside of the show. Follow Dr. Borger on Instagram at Dr. Borger and find more online and ways to work with Dr. Borger at www.theaestheticdoctor.com. Until next time, be well.